Greetings. Well, I had a very reasonable request from one of the viewers who had said, Bill, would you do something about growing ornamental plants in Hawaii? I said, well, yeah, I got a bunch of them. And this morning the sun was shining. And I said, yeah, this looks like a great time to do this. Gracie agreed, too. She says, hey, come on, Bill. Let's go on out and shoot a video about our flowers. Well, unfortunately, about the time I got to it, what happened is the rain started. It's misty out here. Cat and I are sitting out in the mist. Got the camera sitting under the roof edge. So, Gracie and I have found ourselves a nice dry space right over here. Uh, under the edge of the carport roof for a while. We shall see if the rain subsides and I can wander, but for now. In talking about landscaping with ornamentals in eastern Hawaii, I'm going to stick with that. Uh, the conditions here in Hawaii are drastically different from the east to the west and from the bottom to the top of the island, tremendous, tremendous difference. I mean, we rise above timberline here. There's like almost no plants as you go up because it gets so cold. Um, you know, down at the shore, everything is jungle on this side. On the other side, it's pretty much desert. So what you do, what you use, and how you do it is going to depend on where you live very specifically. But... It's easy enough to generalize about the eastern side of Hawaii that gets trade winds. And so that would be from um, Hamakua through North Hilo, through uh, Hilo, South Hilo, and Puna. The reason these areas are very similar is because the rainfall is similar. Probably varies somewhere between about maybe 90 inches and on up to about 200 inches. That's a very important fact, and it means two things here. <laughs> One, irrigation systems on this side of the island are not really required. Uh, getting brand new plants to take hold, small plants on lava when you're using cinder and things, there you may need to use some additional water. Uh, that that very well could be. Uh, I have I have soil here, and still on occasion it's gotten dry enough when I was putting out brand new plants that I was uh, inclined to water yeah. for a little while, once or twice. After any plant gets established around here and sends roots into the soil, the need for watering is very rare. It, we can have droughts. It can happen, but it's rare. So what that means is irrigation systems, like maybe you know in California, and you say, Bill, how much water does it need? Eh, <laughs> forget it. You won't need it. Now, yeah, that's been my experience. I generally raise nursery stock here in containers without having to provide supplemental watering even. So... Watering is when it comes to maintenance level in this area. The other issue that we're all faced with here on ornamentals, or no matter what it is, but particularly ornamentals, this is green. Yeah. This place is so green. Everywhere you look, you see green, 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 green grows on top of green, on top of green, and if you don't move your car often enough, moss and algae grows all over it. Green is the color of the landscape. Well, green's nice, but it becomes monotonous. And it, 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 colored foliage here, uh, large, brightly colored flowers, all essential. When designing landscapes, you want to make sure that you're putting in plenty of stuff that's got lots of interesting colors other than green. Um, and so I can show you some examples on that. The other thought I have on it is that things in this area, generally, if they are well adapted, grow at an alarming rate of speed. Yeah, folks who are not familiar with how fast something can grow here, watch out. <laughs> so, 
You know, in most places where I've sold nursery stock in the past, I, I run across people all the time, you know, worrying about how fast does it grow? Will it grow fast enough for me? I need a fast-growing plant. You don't want fast-growing plants around here unless they happen to be food or herbs, you know, or maybe something that's utilitarian. Uh, if you're planning to harvest and build your house from bamboo or you're a bamboo furniture builder, yeah, fast is good keeps in material so there are reasons but when it comes to establishing plants in a home landscape for beauty fast is bad <laughs> it's terrible in fact because the maintenance level on it will be extreme uh, other issue on ornamentals here is it is really best when you get started to put in an ornamental garden for beauty around your house, that you have pretty much killed off everything that pre-existed before you get started. I tell you, anybody with a soft heart that says, oh, well, it's, it's a nice little tree, or oh, I like that little plant, you know. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Almost anything that came on its own here, in the lower elevations of the islands, Almost everything is uh, the most stinking, nastiest weeds on the face of the planet. We <laughs> have very few uh, good, desirable native plants uh, below 4,000 feet. Uh, the one that we do have in abundance was the ohia tree, and I say was because the rapid ohia death is killing them off. Uh, and so it's very probable that one's going to be gone too. There's a couple others, you know, at the coast you find the, the false oaks, the, you find uh, um, uh, the, the, the uh, hala, uh, there's pandanus. There's, uh, pandanus is down there, that's what they use for doing all the weaving, the hats and baskets and so on. Now there's a few, there's a few around, uh, but mostly you really got to get up around 4,000 feet in the National Park and start wandering through the woods before you start to see what is mostly native plants. They have their problems up there with Lucifer's wand and ginger and a bunch of other things that get into the landscapes too, but uh, you know, down on this end of the island oftentimes what you find is guava jungle. Um, well, there is no point in saving any of that, or you may have albizia, or oh, even worse, the gunpowder trees. Um, there are very few trees that might have pre-existed in your properties here when you first see them that are worth saving. On occasion, somebody's planted something, or maybe the pigs planted a mango or an avocado or something on you that could be useful. You know, there there can be things. Uh, out there in your lot that might be worth keeping but by and large most of it is uh, weeds and really uh, vile dangerous plants frankly they crack they drop stuff they spread seed like insanity they creep 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 so uh, pretty much removing what you had to begin with if you're attempting to install and establish a, a, a beautiful landscape and functional useful landscape is sorry but it's really true I see so many people who come here and they have this oh I don't want to hurt this tree or that tree or you know it's all weeds man <laughs> and they're gonna come back to haunt you too they will um, if Miley Pilau for instance which is an evergreen vine that stinks that's why they call it Pilau um, it, that one's terrible. Oh my goodness! It could take over everything. Uh, Wainaku grass, you know. I, I can go on like that for a long time. We have some terrible weeds here. Um, the 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 um, the uh, vivi, strawberry guavas. Oh, oh, <laughs> they're terrible, um, and they completely choke landscapes. So you really can't do anything else. Um, you know, I've seen people who wouldn't believe that program you need to kill it all off before you start uh, and so they get started with something and put in some things and next thing you know it just turns back into jungle again and the work is all gone 
Uh, there are several ways that you can get there. Um, me, I prefer to use actually the woven industrial weed block, uh, the, the, the costly stuff that you get from the uh, commercial houses. They use it for nursery floors and things. It'll hold up 10 to 15 years. Good stuff. You can walk on it. You can drive on it to a certain extent. And some things can make their way through it, but not very easily. And in general, if you put it down across a landscape uh, and wait 6 to 12 months, whatever was underneath is most likely dead. Now, the only way that it will persist beneath the weed block is if... Things like Wainaku grass or things like Miley, they have, uh, the Wainaku's got rhizomes, the Miley's got vines, and if they extend from here in the sunlight underneath the weed block, what's connected to the piece in the sunlight will keep what's underneath the weed block alive until you lift it off, and so it will come popping right back out. Um, there are several different ways you can approach that. You know, you can just cover up really large areas of weed block. I buy it by the uh, 300 by 12 foot wide rolls and I'll usually unroll several rolls of it at a time covering massive areas. Um, so the, the stuff more towards the center really does die off. But I always go around the outside edges either by digging trenches to disconnect by using herbicides, by using flamers, um, there's a variety, Any anything it takes to be able to kill off what's out here, at least say a foot or so of it outside where you put down your, your barriers. Now, I like the weed block. Some people use poly. Poly does work, like six mil black poly, you know, uh, but yeah, it, it, it punches holes too easy, and it doesn't. It's photo degrade. It photo degrades. It's not UV stable, and so you put it down. You probably get enough life out of it uh, to be able to do some good work because it'll probably hold up at least a year before it starts degrading. But I suggest you a pick it up before it starts to fragment because you'll have pieces everywhere. Uh, the sun does that to it. Eats the plastic. Oh. Uh, it's also, if you're in a situation where you are on lava, you won't be able to walk on the stuff if you've used it because you'll punch holes through it, making it ineffective. Um, so that's why I like the weed block. But I have used black poly before in California where I didn't have, you know, lava or things like that. And it does work. So it's possible. I use an awful lot of post-consumer cardboard and newspapers around here. Uh, mostly I use them, you know, right around a, a new tree or, you know, we put uh, mulch uh, from grinding coffee on my uh, dragon fruit the other day. And uh, before I, we chipped the mulch down, the first thing I did was, you know, whack the weeds, pulled up the big ones put down newspaper and a sheet of cardboard over the top of everything to bury it, then went and put the chips over the top. This is advisable, because if you just put the chips over the top, the plants are going to pop right through that, unless maybe you got, you know, a foot or more. Well, I was only using a few inches around the dragon fruit, so we needed another barrier underneath there. Well, folks, it's looking like the drizzle might have stopped, and so I'm going to stop the basic groundwork right there and head out, and let's have a look at some of these plants. Okay. Alrighty, so, as I mentioned previously, green is a problem. So, here we have Song of India. That's a Dracaena. Um, the Song of India uh, has nice, bold, whitish, goldish stripes. Well, I like that. <laughs> Down below it over there, uh, we got a cane begonia, uh, and that has uh, polka dots and red color. Uh, black beyond it there, that's an amethyst plant. And again, that has beautiful, almost black purple foliage. I am actually not 100% sure of the name on this one. It came to me as a cutting. But apparently there are large and small versions of this here on the island. This is the dwarf. 
was put in about five years ago and it has needed no pruning. That palm tree up behind it, there is the uh, dwarf Laotian date, the Phoenix Robellini. Well, the Phoenix Robellinis are dwarf palms. Um, that's been there since 2007, and uh, that's as big as it's gotten. Stuffed in over here with the bright red leaves uh, and the yellow, you see Croton. Croton is a very good choice around here. It has gorgeous foliage. The downside of Croton... The cokey frogs love the large, smooth leaves, and it doesn't respond well to being sprayed with acid. If I use citric acid to chase away the frogs, it knocks the leaves off the stuff. It's a real problem. Uh, which, I guess, brings up another major point. Um, we planted all this stuff near the house before the frogs got this high up the mountain. Once the frogs got this high up the mountain, I kind of wish I'd just mown everything for 50 feet around the house flat to keep the frogs out because this shrubbery is attractive to them. And it's a pain. All right, there is a Tahitian gardenia in the middle. Um, gardenias are a real good choice around here. They grow like natural, like weeds almost. They strike from cuttings. Yeah, because he, uh, Ellen's with the Hilo Orchid Society, we have orchids everywhere. This is one known as a Honahona orchid. And we pretty much usually hang them on trees. This is what was left of an ohia tree that caught rod. I planted that tree, and my mistake was probably putting it right here near the driveway where car tires probably carried the disease to it. This brown leaf stuff over here is Hawaiian tea, spelled T-I. Tea is one of the canoe plants that was originally brought here. Uh, at one time, the original green was used as boundary markers for uh, property and such. Um, there has to be a lot of genetic variation in it because, man, they have bred so many types of this plant. Uh, over there are some of the tall red ones are some more of the tall red ones over there along the driveway. Uh, this one cultivar in the front is absolutely red. That is the most red uh, tea plant I've seen. It has the same form and size, I think, as the regular green, but wow, is it insanely red. I love flowers in my garden, but a lot of the nice, soft, little flowers we're familiar with in the mainland, you know, the cosmos, the zinnias, and all that kind of stuff, under this rainfall, those plants really get pummeled, and they just don't look their best around here. Um, and so shrubs that have uh, rather large, stronger flowers, like hibiscus, which a hibiscus reblooms every day. And so, uh, you know, the flowers that got beat by the rain last night and they're fading, they're replaced with brand new fresh ones. Um, we collect hibiscus. I have all sorts of different types here. The ones here in the front yard are very common. You know, this is Empire, Hula Girl. These are all real, real common forms of hibiscus. Nothing rare about these. Yeah. Now, there is one problem with growing them here. And it's this stuff here. See all this distortion? Um, I don't know whether it's a foliar nematode or a burrowing mite. I've never really bothered to look at it. Um, this one over here is a red with variegated leaves, and it grows really slow, so it doesn't get the kind of pruning that my others do. Uh, and so it's kind of infested. Hibiscus around here that don't get pruned hard usually get a pretty good concentration of that. It's worse on the west than it is in the east. But if you cut your hibiscus all the time and treat them like they were rose bushes, you won't suffer much from it. Another one of the well-adapted plants here is the virea. It's got that little petunia pink flowers over here. Um, that's a uh, tropical rhododendron. It's in the rhododendron azalea family. Uh, it is really easy to grow here, and it strikes well from cuttings. Yep. Hibiscus are just so cheery. Some forms of the New Guinea impatient uh, do really well here. This classic pink 
it's uh, well man it's like a wild plant and all I have to do is prune it put stems in pots and I get more and more and more of them up behind it over there you see the peace lily again that's another really good choice here only downside is the uh, slugs do like to chew on this one this is a uh, mystery gardenia again well adapted most variety of philodendron thrive here uh, a lot of types have become nasty weeds in the area this one here is Xanadu. It's a dwarf type. Seems pretty well behaved. I like it. Unfortunately, you can't smell through this camera <laughs> that orchid down there, which I believe is Linda Lingle, uh, named after one of the past Republican governors here on the island. Um, it smells pretty darn good. There's a real nice honohona. That's a beauty. Butter yellow phalaenopsis and some oncidiums over here. Uh, some things <laughs> like uh, Jabuticaba, uh, they're actually food plants, but uh, their unusual nature of fruiting up and down the trunks really makes these very interesting ornamentals. Well, most of what I just showed is out in the sun, but there are sun and shade ornamentals. And these are all anthuriums, uh, which is a classic Hawaiian ornamental. We grow a lot of anthuriums here. These days, most of the anthuriums have gone to dwarf. Um, the larger, older forms are not popular anymore. But in the landscape, personally, I like the big old ones. This one here is almost black. African mass Galacasia does fine here, uh, as does ground orchids. We have a few different colors of them around. Coleus. Coleus is another great colored plant here. Thrives, easy to make more from cuttings, just great. Well, over here is a kakui nut tree that was planted from a seed in 2009. Oh my goodness, that's my cat. Gracie, what you doing up there, girl? Huh? You see lizards? <laughs> Oh, be darned. Yeah, so this here's Gracie's favorite tree. Um, and hanging on it, we have uh, little orchids there, uh, orchids here, uh, orchids over there. The trees are great mounts for orchids here. Here's an interesting black Hawaiian tea. Narrow leaves. As with the orchids, too, uh, Ellen is really the palm collector. This is uh, the one they used for making rattan furniture. And boy, is it bristly. Uh, this Pritchardia had a uh, tropical apricot drop on it that we cut down. So it leaves a little tattered, but it's doing all right. This is one of the few of the native Hawaiian palms, actually. There aren't very many. There's some more examples of tea. There's a narrow leaf croton. I am not positive just what the variety on that palm is. Ellen dragged it in here. It's uh, supposedly an exotic. Maybe she knows? I don't know. There's another one over there that's a clumper. Uh, mostly not blooming. Uh, when it goes to bloom, this is covered, but here's some heliconia. This little heliconia here just kind of runs around the landscape a bit. Um, it's an easy one. <laughs> Right down here is one of them dwarf anthuriums. They're pretty cute, I guess, but in a the landscape, they kind of get lost. Ah, white and green striped jobby over there with the pinky tips is raspberry ice bougainvillea. Um, raspberry ice is one of my favorite bogies. 
Yeah, it has a, a colored foliage, which is really dashing. Uh, it has raspberry colored flowers. going to get ready to come out there pretty soon on all the tips. And so it's really stunning. But like most single flowered bougainvilleas, the flower bracts leave behind them a serious thorn, which I once tripped and embedded one in the back of my skull uh, and had to pull it out. I'm not real pleased uh, with that. And so I've removed almost all bougainvillea from my landscape, despite the fact they grow pretty well here. And this one may be history too, we'll see. Um, a note though, the double bougainvilleas, they do not make the spine. And so if you plant double ones, uh, double flowered, that is, uh, Tahitian Dawn, I believe, is one that comes to mind. Um, you won't have the spines. And this little thing right here uh, is a Kalanchoe. Uh, <clears throat> some people call it Kalancho, uh, that I don't believe is pronounced uh, in Latin that way, but it'll do. <laughs> Either way, uh, I happen to like them. They're easy grow. They fill up a lot of space around here, and they really got a pretty neat flowering structure. Uh, we grow a few ground orchids here. Uh, down here is a Cymbidium. Uh, that's a Southeast Asian mountain orchid. Uh, and over here, uh, that one there is an Epilobium. That's an orange flowered gem. I found the agaves to be kind of a surprise around here. So far, every one of them I've planted has done well. This is one of the spineless types from Central America. It's, a, I believe, Agave Atenionata. Um, so it's a smooth leaf. Uh, I generally associate these with, uh, you know, dry or desert conditions, but they seem to thrive here in Mountain View. Yeah, a couple of Gavi flower spike out here. One covered in plantlets. The other one there pre-bloom. Uh, these are on some sort of a gold margin to Gavi. I don't know what type. I suspect it's a hybrid, but I don't know that. Um, most agave makes seed. This one is making plantlets on the stalk. Yep, across the way there, you'll see some Bali sacred golden bamboo. Um, now it's not across the way towards the outside of the property uh, as a windbreak or screen, thank you. Uh, bamboo is a very poor choice for that. It grows way too fast. It's over there to keep it way far away from my house in case I ever happen to become incapacitated and can't control its growth. Uh, it won't make it to the house before I pass away. <laughs> yeah, that's the reason. If you're uh, growing bamboo, I highly recommend that you are a harvester, especially here in Hawaii. That one there is getting 20, 30 feet tall or so. And it's two years old from a gallon can. Whoa. Uh, next to it over there, we see a Hawaiian koa tree. Uh, they're both lumber and ornamentals here. The koa is difficult below 4,000 feet because it tends to die off from uh, water molds that were imported. But it's still, uh, I get more than half of them to take here. There's a good one. Um, they're worth an awful lot if you ever have to cut them down. It's one of the most expensive lumbers in the U.S. Well, right here I'm using woven industrial weed block that I had previously mentioned, uh, killing the pasture. And you will see along the outside margin over here, everything is brown. Uh, that's because I came by with a flamer, and I flamed the outside margin to try to keep it from covering the weed block or crawling underneath. Uh, it's getting pretty good. Um, there'll still be weeds once I pull this up. They're going to come up from seed, but most of the really gross perennial ones uh, will have succumbed. And back here between the koa trees is where Ellen keeps her collection of exotic hibiscus forms. Every time we find a, a new one, we'll grab a cutting and get it going. She's got quite a few of them going back there. Well, a big green monster there in the center in the back. Um, that's a Himalayan purple striped bamboo. That's probably about 25 feet high or so. Uh, February 2017, uh, that was a one-gallon plant about 18 inches high. Uh, stuff grows at a frightening rate of speed. 
that is at the rear corner of the property here again just in case yep uh, even with harvesting I can't keep on top of this Himalayan bamboo <laughs> get some idea Woo -wee. yeah she's big yeah, this one right over here is uh, uh, warm and that's the dwarf Buddha belly tropical Buddha belly Eh, Himalayan magnolia called Mycalia chimpaca alba. Uh, very fragrant flowers. Yeah, this is how. It's a native hibiscus. Oh, the angel trumpet uh, is fragrant yeah, and makes a good shrub for the area. Um, it's particularly good for hanging orchids on. That one has orchids festooned all over this thing. Growing things on other things here is natural. Uh, soil is not needed in many cases. Here we have orchids on a lime, orchids on a lime, lipstick plant on a lime. Uh, back over here we have uh, a Nepenthes. Uh, that's one of the tropical pitcher plants. You see them down there hanging in their little hanging baskets. See some of the pitchers. They eat cokey frogs. <laughs> yeah, hona hona orchids. Um, we have regular taro for eating, but then next to it we have uh, some Chinese taro. It's called Hilo Princess. That's a ornamental runner. Very beautiful black leaves. Yeah, with a Mickey Mouse anthurium. Uh, the raindrops are coming again, so <clears throat> I'll stop walking around out there. Um, but cost me considerable to get my camera repaired the last time I flooded it. Yeah. I'm going to stay here where it's dry and I think I'll talk a little bit more about the particulars of growing ornamentals here. Um, a. Some plants are so well adapted here in Hawaii to the conditions we have that they grow like wild plants. Some plants are so poorly adapted to conditions here that you can barely get them to grow. And sometimes finding out the difference, it, 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 you just got to experience it, you know, you go for it, you find things out. Um, sometimes I think maybe under certain circumstances, certain plants will thrive, but under others they won't. But in general, for ornamental landscape plants here, if you want a low-maintenance garden, you really want to start working with plants that are very well adapted to the local climate so you don't have to be using sprays of insecticide, fungicides. You aren't going to have to come out and fertilize. Um, also, you want to stay away from plants that grow too fast. The nice, slow-growing stuff is generally the best. Um, because things here do grow too fast. Um, you saw the bamboo, think back, okay? When you get into something like that, where you got a plant that will be, uh, you know, goes from a stick that big, single stalk, from February 2017 to the current moment uh, here, um, so what, we're five years, not five, four years later, uh, <laughs> The plant is, you know, 30 feet high and 10 feet in diameter at this point. Uh, and I harvest. All my poles and supports and everything around here are made from that bamboo plant. I can't keep on top of it. I cut it and use it for propagation in the nursery and still. So beware of really fast growing stuff. It's not good here. It will cause you a horrible problem in the long run. Uh, the kukui nut um, that the cat was perched in, that was a seed in 2009. And it also grows really fast. Whew, it's huge. Um, the cat did come down. 
<laughs> but it, it, it's huge, you know, it's a monster. And if it wasn't for the fact that the pocket of shade that it creates has allowed Ellen to plant ground orchids, anthuriums, uh, uh, blue ginger, all sorts of different plants that love to have shaded environments. Um, otherwise, it'd be kind of a pain. They'd be using up a lot of space over there for nothing. So, then that makes high maintenance. You don't want that. You want things that stay small. Don't get too big. You know, when you put them in their space, they tend to stay there. You know, my hibiscus, I tend to go through and prune them with a hedge trimmer maybe twice a year. It's not too much work. I don't have that many of them out front. The ones out back, I don't worry about. They just get to grow like trees uh, along the back property. But out front over here, they get a couple times a year. I, the wood is uh, quite useful for stick mulching. Because hibiscus doesn't need to be fed. So, in general, plants that are well adapted here do not require fertilizers. They usually don't require very much maintenance as far as insect control either. Um, some do, some don't. Um, now, there's a lot of stuff that you may be familiar with in your gardens elsewhere. Like, maybe you'll like to grow roses. Whew, forget it. <laughs> That's my suggestion. Don't even think about it. There's so many great choices here. Um, the rose is a temperate plant to begin with. We even had issues in California with getting enough winter chill on the bushes. You know, we used to spray the bushes after pruning with lime sulfur to knock all the leaves off to actually induce uh, a chemical dormancy. You know, so that they would come back out right. Here, there's no chill, none whatsoever every fungus under the sun, and a dozen different things that will eat your roses. My suggestion is plant heliconias, plant gingers, plant uh, hibiscus, plant uh, uh, anthuriums, plant a whole variety of things that are actually adapted here. Now I get blue hydrangea to grow okay. It grows a lot better at 4,000 feet, but I brought cuttings here and it does grow. It's more of a temperate plant. But it seems okay. It's awful slow in this environment. That's much I can say for it. And I do not recommend uh, attempting to establish ornamental gardens in this environment until you have pretty much completely killed off everything that was there initially. Uh, until you do that, it's a waste. The, the jungle will take you back over. So, or at least make such a mess out of it that it's going to be so hard to try to clean it up again. Um, I like weed block. It's very handy here. I use a lot of cardboard. I use wood chips. Um, I know Joe Hewitt successfully uses huge amounts of wood tip chips that uh, he gets from a guy who does tree cutting. You know, and I mean, Joe uses like one to two feet in places. It's enough to keep things pretty good, but then the seeds drift and seeds come up on top. Uh, and so you still have maintenance no matter what. Uh, you, there will be maintenance. Uh, weeds here are like uh, nothing I had ever seen anywhere else I ever lived. Um, yeah, the, and there's really no choice but to master them initially. Um, otherwise they will master you. Well, I can't think of anything else to say. The rain's starting up. I think I'll go back inside where it's dry and edit this video. All right. If anybody's got questions and comments, you know, there's always that stuff below. And as general, I will stop in and see what we can do about it. Hang loose, folks. Aloha.